the entity meaning a demon, for example. For example, yeah. Like a scary, a scary entity. Exactly. Right. And then, and then it's sitting on the chest, as in the classic accounts. You know, we we have historical accounts of the succubi sitting on the chest and so forth. Um, and and then um, they wake up and possessed. You know. Ah, so it finally the entity entered them. Yeah, that's that's coming cl- closer and closer, and then finally possessing them. And when they wake up, they're possessed. That's scary. That, that's that's what's subjectively reported. Now, of course, right? What the what the ontological reality of this stuff is is who knows? You know. Patrick McNamara received his BA in psychology from Boston University. He was awarded the PhD in Behavioral Neuroscience, also from Boston University. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at the Aphasia Research Center, Boston VA Medical Center. He has over 15 years of experience working directly on the problem of the nature and function of dreaming. Dr. McNamara has published over 50 scientific papers on dreams, as well as several books. He has been the recipient of grant awards from the National Institutes of Health to further study sleep and dreams. Professor McNamara, welcome to Eurotrash. Thank you, Zaza. All right. Perhaps this is going to be a little bit too much information, but please do bear with me. Um, A couple of years ago, I developed a terrible case of IBS, uh, you know, Mm. the irritable bowel syndrome. And because the onset was kind of so sudden and so severe, my MD suggested that I do a colonoscopy as well as an endoscopy, which are, you know, not the most fun medical exams out there. Uh, Luckily, it was all done under anesthesia. Just before the procedure, the doctor put the mask on and they told me count to 10. And before I said three, I was completely out. Um, It was just a total absence of Mm -hmm. anything, really. I've never, you know, gone under before. It was a really unusual experience. When I woke up, I couldn't possibly say how much time has passed. It could have been five seconds or 200 years. You know, the the off switch seemed so deep. And ever since then, I wondered, why isn't sleep more like that? Or why doesn't it feel more like that? Or should I rather ask uh, Professor McNamara, why do we dream? <laughs> Start off with a really simple question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's the tradition of this podcast. Go big yeah. or go home. Good. Uh, well, of course, there are dozens and dozens of research scientists trying to answer that question. Everybody's got a theory about it. Um, I think there's some consensus that dreaming is uh, contributes to Uh, consolidation of emotional memories. So one reason why we dream is it seems to facilitate the consolidation of emotional memories. Another theory that's got a lot of empirical backing to it is called the um, social simulation hypothesis. And what that says is we dream in order to simulate or test out or mentally model uh, social interactions in our lives, particularly significant ones. Oh, um, <clears throat> right. Uh, so that's another theory. Uh, uh, a related theory to that is threat simulation theory, which says we practice um, threats in our dreams and thereby are better able to avoid threats when we meet them in uh, daytime. Yet another theory, uh, one that I tend to favor, is. Um, so-called uh, counterfactual um, simulation theory about dreaming, and that is that during dreams we generate what are known as um, counterfactuals, and these are mental simulations that uh, produce um, um, scenes or ideas or whole simulation, whole worlds that counter some other world that we encountered during the daytime. So they hold up a sort of a mirror to our daytime events, but then spin out scenarios that uh, are subtly modify that daytime event. And thereby we learn from the events. Take a trivial example. 
a, a, a typical counterfactual is something like if we say to ourselves, if I had taken my umbrella, I would not have gotten wet this morning. Uh, so <clears throat> a dream is like, so you, you, um, you're taking the umbrella, so you learn you, if you do that next time, you won't get wet. Now, what, and during the daytime, when we generate these counterfactuals, they're constrained by our prefrontal cortex and our executive control systems. But during uh, REM sleep, when we have our most vivid dreams, they're unconstrained. So we continue to spin out these, these counterfactual scenarios. And they get, you know, and as the spinning gets, go, uh, uh, moves along, they get more and more bizarre, farther and farther away from the triggering event. And so they unfold like this panoply of alternative worlds. And because we're presented with all these alternative worlds in our REM sleep dreams, we can look at the world we're in during the daytime and hold it up to scrutiny and say, hey, wow, it doesn't, it doesn't match those, those simulated worlds I was just in during my dreams. So maybe I can change it for the better, both personally and socially. So that's a sort of long-winded way to give you like three or four current empirically supported um, hypotheses about why we dream. There's there's many more theories, but those are some of the ones that I think have the most empirical support. Emotional memory consolidation, counterfactual world simulation, social simulation, and threat simulation. Can all of them be true, or are they mutually yeah, exclusive? Yeah, I think so. I think so, right. yeah. Um, there's no internal... There's no inherent contradictions between, like, if I, if I socially simulate... a me interacting with socially significant people in my life, there's no reason why once I depict that interaction, I can't spin out counterfactual scenarios to it. Like if I, for example, if during the day I have an interaction with somebody and I, I walk away and say, I wish I had said that, you know? So, yeah. um, and then if I say, I wish I had said that, and, and then the whole conversation would have gone better, that's a counterfactual. So that's a triggering event, and then I'll probably dream about that social interaction, but there'll be a bunch of counterfactual scenarios spinning out against, well, I could have said this, I could have said that, I could have said that, and if I said that, then he would say this, and you know, and on and on it goes. And that's why we call dreams sort of bizarre sometimes. So yeah, there's, there's no reason why we can't have all of them somehow working together. Right. How does this knowledge then get integrated into your daytime? Because I often don't remember my dreams. Does that mean that this knowledge was lost when I woke up or is it still somewhere in the brain, you know, tumbling about? Um, I don't think it's lost. I think some of it probably is, but there's no uh, reason why we can't consolidate memories and information without being aware we're doing it. In fact, we do that all the time. You know, so we don't have to remember the dreams in order to consolidate the key messages in those dreams that our brain wants to consolidate. You know, like what is the significance of that emotional interaction I had with my ex-wife? You know, do I have to reflect about that for days? Maybe, but in my dreams, I can probably process unconsciously whatever was significant about that stored in long-term memory and benefit from that uh, storage, you know, without being particularly conscious of it. I've noticed that I often dream about the things that I thought of just before I fell asleep. Or if it's a movie that I watched just before I fell asleep, then it's somehow going to be um, spinning in my mind in a slightly different or odd or, like you said, bizarre version. Whatever is emotionally salient tends to get dreamed about. Um, but but that's not always true, you know. It, uh, like Freud called these kinds of things day residue, you know, like um, there's a sort of hmm. random fleeting um, residua from the day's events. When we, when we go into sleep, we go through um, these different um, architectonic stages as defined by electrophysiology. You know, there's stage N1, stage N2, 
uh, REM and then stage three. Um, so uh, N1 is where we start to fall asleep. And as we start to fall asleep, we're, we get flooded by all these images. They're called hypnagogic in, images. And a lot of that contains day residue and a lot of just stuff that, you know, just clutters our minds as we're falling mm. asleep. But some of that, some of the array of that fast, dense imagery that sort of wells up as we're falling asleep, then gets picked up and processed in N2, and, which is a light stage of sleep, and then um, processed in REM sleep when we um, switch into REM. So a theme gets picked up, gets processed initially in, in N1, then more deeply in N2, and then very deeply in stage REM. And presumably also in N3 as well. Yeah. Since we're here, this array of images that, that happens once we start falling asleep. I play basketball and I often have this thing happen to me where I've there's an image of a basketball rushing towards me and I'm too late mm. to catch it. And then I kind of twitch and wake up suddenly, you know, in the oh, midst yeah, of yeah. this array of you images. What, what is that yeah, thing? I, I get similar things after I uh, do long drives on the highway, you know, like three or four hour long drives where you're seeing nothing but road ahead of you, you know, and, and as I fall yeah. asleep after one of those long drives, I, you know, I, I see, I'm put back in that situation. Uh, I think I think we can understand stuff like that as um, day residues, um, and also sort of um, I think they're consistent with the threat simulation theory we were talking about. So um, we, we sort of unconsciously say to ourselves, "Well, if I take my hands off the wheel, or if I don't watch where the ball is heading, it can go right, you know, smash me right in the face." So, you know, I need to I need to be more aware. And so that those images are then used to um, simulate that potential threat so that we can avoid it in the future. I mean, that's one possible. Who knows, mm. really? But, Damn. you know, that's what that's one possibility. <laughs> is is our brain ever chilling because it sounds a little bit paranoid to be honest the closest we get to just a chill state is um n3 which is otherwise known as slow wave sleep and it's very very close to that anesthesia you were talking about you know being put out um however we know even in slow wave sleep a lot of processing is going on um including a lot of memory consolidation is happening there as well so no there is no the brain is never completely offline it sort of down regulates in many respects but it's still the biggest hog of energy in the body at all all times so yeah it, when it goes into slow wave sleep it sort of um, revs down as far as it can go without completely shutting off. And during slow wave sleep, a lot of housekeeping functions occur. So there's a lot of um, immune system repair, for example, uh, neuronal mm. repair, um, um, growth hormone gets released and sort of repairs the body during slow wave sleep. So um, slow wave sleep is extremely important. You get tons of slow wave and REM sleep during development. You know, so um, you get the largest amounts of those two forms of sleep during childhood development. Uh, and okay. without either one, then the brain doesn't develop normally. So. Right. Uh, in layman's terms, what is REM sleep and how does it fit into the story of human evolution? Ah, really good question. Um, REM sleep is um, rapid eye movement sleep. And it's one of the most peculiar biological systems ever studied. Um, in humans, it occurs every 90 minutes when we're asleep. There are some scientists who say a version of it occurs during daytime as well, every 90 minutes, but, but it occurs every 90 minutes during sleep. And um, during REM sleep, the eyes are typically closed and underneath the closed eyelids, 
the the eyeballs dart back and forth. So that's why it's called the rapid eye movement. And however, the body is motorically paralyzed. So you cannot move when you're in REM sleep. Your body is completely paralyzed. And um, you get what are known as autonomic nervous system storms. So your autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight system, starts to go through these bursts or discharges. And um, the areas of the brain that deal with emotion and memories um, and sense of self get more activated than they are during daytime. So those parts of the brain become extremely active. But the more evolutionarily recent parts of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it's called, tends to downregulate. So that tends to fall asleep. So you got this. Uh, the other thing that occurs in both men and women is sexual activation. So with the onset of REM, um, um, men get erections, penile erections, and the clitoris gets engorged, and there's pelvic thrusting and other sexual behaviors in women during REM sleep. There's pelvic thrusting quote, unquote, during REM yeah. sleep. Yeah. And okay. Why do we get sexually activated in such a vulnerable nobody position uh, when we're sleeping? Not nobody that knows. I'm aware of. No, no, nobody knows. Okay. To sum it all up. So you got this extremely activated brain state. You've got the body. You can't move yet you're in, you're sexually activated and your autonomic nervous system's going wild and to top it all off we're forced to watch these things we call dreams so you asked me what is the evolutionary background or history or function of rem sleep it, it's a very difficult question because what could possibly be the evolutionary function of a system like that it takes enormous amounts of energy and it makes us very vulnerable to predators, you know, because you can't move. Right. So what could possibly be the function? Again, there's, there's tons of theories out there. None of them um, have achieved any kind of scientific consensus though. What do you think is the most plausible explanation? Room sleep puts us in um, brain states that are turbulent what are technically called turbulent. And when we're in brain states that are extremely turbulent, we're processing information at much more denser rates, rapid rates, more effectively. So an enormous amount of information is being processed during REM. And um, that's the function of REM in my view, to process the the unknown unknowns out there stuff we don't even know that we don't know you know new adaptive lands landscapes maybe or frontiers of um, human in innovation uh, creativity we're in the most creative state possible in a rim state because it has a very high cholinergic environment in in the brain and under those physiologic conditions, the brain makes very disparate semantic connections. So things that we don't ordinarily put together, we put together. And, and that is the basis of creativity. It's thinking outside the box, you know. So, so I know that's a long-winded answer, but I think the best um, evidence for the function of REM sleep is that it has something to do with creativity and exploring novel brain states and not novel uh, cognitive frontiers. Back home in the Balkans, where I'm originally from, I remember every granny I knew having this thick tome with the title, The Big Old Book of Dreams on their <laughs> shelves. Um, and in it, you had kind of very clear cut interpretations of every element of your dreams. Um, for example, dreaming of a big brown dog, I don't know, meant that somebody will do you a favor mm. and that kind of stuff. Very precise, sort of. Now, is there some sort of a universal key that can 
help us unlock the meaning of our dreams or are our dreams more like a completely improvisational kind of, I don't know, straight to DVD Steven Seagal flick that contains no actual insights? <laughs> I think there are some common themes that seem to be, um, uh, you, you see it sort of cross-culturally, some universal themes. Um, uh, Such as, for example. Being chased, teeth falling yeah. out, um, sexual encounters, um, so, social in interactions with significant others, um, common threats. These you, you, you see even in hunter-gatherer tribes who are pre-literate, uh, pre-industrialized. Um, so, uh, they, yeah, there's, so these common themes um, tend to also be associated with symbols that are rather transparent. And those symbols, I would say, uh, the dream code books going way back, you know, we, we have dream interpretation manuals going back um, 2,500 years, you know, and you see the same sort of themes there. Uh, so, uh, so though, when, so when those common themes emerge and they're associated with sort of transparent symbols, and I'd say the dream interpretation manuals are probably more or less correct for those, you know, that narrow set of cross-cultural themes. But, but then once you get beyond that, then um, dream interpretation, I don't think there's any empirically validated system yet. I mean, there, there are some, there are some um, interesting patterns that have emerged empirically. Like, for example, if you, like what, we and others have done studies where you analyze the content of say 40, 50,000 dreams cross-culturally. And we find patterns like uh, my group didn't, I, I confirm this, but other groups found this. For example, when, um, whenever a stranger appears in a dream, the, the odds of a physical aggression against the dreamer are significantly increased. So the symbol of a stranger appearing in a dream indicates or points to physical aggression against the dreamer. Wow. So we see patterns like that. You know, so there's something to um, symbolic interpretations of dreams. We don't yet have the, the key to unlock all of it, but we're, you know, we're making progress. So would it be fair to say that whenever there's a new element appearing in the dream, it's usually in the form of a threat and the brain is again, playing out these different threat scenarios. Mm -mm. I wouldn't say so. No, no, I mean, but that happens frequently, frequently, you know, there are threats, but, uh, when new elements occur, it could mean many different, I mean, uh, and that real novelty occurs in dreams. This is another very important point. Stuff that you've never seen in your life, as far as you know. Um, and that means that real creativity is occurring in dreams. You know, real novelty is occurring there. You made a wonderful video um, for The Well on, on YouTube. Everybody can watch it there. I, I really recommend it. And the title is The Neuroscience of Nightmares. Uh, why does our brain sometimes turn into this really sadistic, nasty horror film director? You know, it goes beyond just playing out the threats, like you said. I remember, I, I vividly still remember my childhood nightmares, uh, much more than any sort of later nightmares. And I was being chased by this school teacher that re didn't really exist in the kindergarten and she had an abnormally large mm -hmm. chin and she was it was just us in the kindergarten which looked the same mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know as the real life version and she would just chase me around and then i started flying and she would mm. start flying and then i went to the ground and she went to the ground mm. and stuff like this and it was really scary i still remember not just the the contents of the dreams but the fear mm -hmm. itself well, we, we know that um, nightmares are more frequently experienced by kids. Um, most kids have 
a handful of nightmares throughout their childhood, uh, but then they tend to go away in adults. Um, between, I mean, estimates vary, but between like three and 20% of the population report frequent nightmares, and you know, and otherwise healthy adults. Um, uh, there's different types of nightmares. So um, sort of run of the mill nightmares tend to be associated with emotional um, memories that can't be consolidated. So, so unprocessed trauma, very likely. Yeah. And um, they, they, but these kind of run of the mill nightmares emerge out of REM sleep. Um, but then there's unprocessed trauma related nightmares that emerge that can emerge from any stage of sleep that is associated with um, trauma and PTSD. And those type tend to be repetitive nightmares where you, you get the same image, scary image over and over again. And those really haunt people and really make their lives miserable to a great extent. Um, even run of the mill nightmares, um, uh, make people's lives miserable sometimes. So um, why does the brain do that? I think the, the strongest uh, theory is that it's trying to consolidate these unpleasant memories, but it hasn't been able to, and it hasn't been able to for a variety of reasons. Could be that the person is is interfering with the consolidation process by taking drugs or drinking alcohol, for example, that will stop the consolidation process. Or wow, it could be um, that that um, the individual, uh, the trauma is too big and it's going to just take time for it to be integrated. Um, but REM sleep specializes in integrating traumatic emotional memories. And that's why it, um, the nightmares tend to emerge from REM sleep because it's the preferred computational mechanism that nature has de devised to handle very intense, unpleasant experiences. So it's like your own personal psychotherapist while you sleep. Yeah, very much so. And um, um, nature did this be be because it's... A, very unpleasant experiences very likely carry very significant information for the reproductive fitness or survival of the individual. So you want a special system handling very unpleasant experiences because we have to learn from them so that we don't repeat them. We don't have to go through them again. And REM is REM sleep is that system REM sleep and dreams that's the system to handle the most significant memories out there both pleasant and unpleasant i see so if you're not like you said interfering in the process by inputting uh, other substances in your body your brain should be able to handle mm -hmm. even like heavily traumatic experiences yeah I mean, it's different years. for everybody, obviously, but it, right. and, it, and it takes of time. Course. For most of us, it will take more than yeah. one night of sleep. You know, it, it, it takes weeks. Right, right. Uh, you know, depend, you know the, the, the more severe the trauma, the longer it will take to integrate. What are demonic possession dreams? Yeah, those are really interesting. And um, they're related to um, the subjective experience of possession. So if you if you do if you interview people who claim that they've been possessed by a spirit entity, particularly during during, during their, their waking, waking time, time. Yeah. when you say okay when did this first happen they they invariably say I woke up from a dream. You know and and what, you know, and then you 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 explore their dreams and then you find out that the spirit entity, this sense of age agency, this sense of a presence first occurred in a dream and uh, when we've done studies where you know we plotted these scenarios over time the spirit entity the sense of presence is first like in the room somewhere in the dream and with the dreamer 
and they're off in the corner. You can you can just sense their presence, and then the the entity is experienced as being at the end of the bed, let's say, or somehow closer to the dreamer. The entity meaning a demon, for example. For example, yeah, like a scary a scary entity. Exactly. Right. And then and then it's sitting on the chest, as in the classic accounts. You know, we we have historical accounts of these succubi sitting on the chest and so forth. Um, and and then um, they wake up and possessed. You know, ah, so it finally the entity entered them. Yeah, that's that's coming cl- closer and closer, and then finally possessing them. And when they wake up, they're possessed. That's scary. That that's that's what's subjectively reported. Now, of course, right? What the what the ontological reality of this stuff is is who knows? You know, like it's some psychiatric syndrome, perhaps. You know, like we don't know, but we have to respect the phenomenology that the patient gives us. You know, they say, this is how I experienced it. So, you know, you, you, you can't ridicule that. You have to respect it. And it actually tells you something about what is probably happening. Like some, perhaps some, well, well, there's several hypotheses. One is that the spirit entities are real and the whole thing is as the patient reports. Another is that they're sort of symbols or represent, representations of an emotional trauma. Uh, or their reaction to an emotional trauma, or maybe you know, a reaction of rage or something. And as the spirit entity um, possesses the individual, they own the rage and they experience that s- subjectively as demonic. Who knows? You know, I mean, this is all sort of frontier stuff that that hasn't been investigated adequate, adequately. But there's a deep link between nightmares. REM sleep nightmares and quote unquote demonic possession that needs more investigation. Would it be fair to say that this sort of demonic possession dreams usually happen to more religious people? Because there's a lot of famous instances of people being or claiming that they're possessed, mm-hmm. you know, and then a lot of movies sure. were made, like The Exorcist yeah. and all of that stuff. And it usually happened to people who are who are brought up. Uh, mm. in a very religious environment. I, I would think that would be fair to say that, you know, unless your your um, extant culture has the supernatural entities that you can call upon to explain your experience, you're not going to invoke them. However, however, there is a condition called sleep paralysis, um, isolated sleep paralysis, where an individual wakes up and they're still partially in REM sleep, so they, they can't move their body. And um, they experience this entire phenomenology. There's a there's a, a malign or demonic presence in the room with them. They're wide awake now. They're not they're not sleeping. They're they're awake, but their body is still in REM, so they're still paralyzed. And they sense this presence in the room and. Then as the sleep paralysis goes on, it gets closer and sits on the chest, et cetera, et cetera. And I've seen, I've read accounts of these um, experiences by people who claim to be atheists, rational atheists, and who nevertheless experience these entities as evil. Um, They don't call them demons, but they call them, you know, like evil entities. Sometimes they'll say space aliens, but most of the time it's evil spirit entities. And then, and then there's um, the experience with psychedelics. You know, for example, psychedelics reproduce the dream state. They have the same um, 5-HT2A serotonin receptor signaling system at the base of it. So the physiology is the same as REM dream. Not the same, but there's a lot of overlapping physiology between REM dreams and the subject experience on um, serotonergic psychedelics. And uh, many atheists who have taken quote unquote heroic doses of a serotonergic (laughs) psychedelic like DMT or something experience quote unquote demonic entities. And they'll call them that even though 
they have been atheists for years. Uh, are those the so-called machine well, elves? Um, those the DMT well, they, creatures. There are many more than machine elves reported, <laughs> but machine elves sort of. My okay. understanding is machine elves tend to um, get reported as you know the initial threshold. You know, like you, you once you, once you get into the alternate world on DMT, the first group of entities you encounter are what Terence McKenna called the machine elves, you know, for lack of better. And these were, they were, they were not especially evil. They were sort of welcoming presences, but they weren't especially good either, sort of more or less neutral. But then as you, as you reach a second threshold and a third threshold, then you start to encounter um, entities that are often experienced as um, gating entities that are experienced as evil. Ultimately, after ego dissolution, you'll you'll experience the, the tendency is to experience a loving, benign entity. But along the way, you encounter those guardian spirits where, which are experienced as evil. Often, not, you know. Uh, sorry, going back to demonic possession yeah. one last time. So if people report being possessed, um, do drugs then work or do they actually need to have some sort of an no. exorcism? I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to um, recommend one way or the other, you know, um, I, my, my study of the issue tells me that um, for people who are believers, um, exorcism can help in chronic cases. But the first thing, um to do with psychiatric medicine typically helps also the sleep paralysis thing now i remembered i have a friend who used to suffer terribly from sleep paralysis she's not a believer and she reported somebody standing on the balcony which was really close to her room mm -hmm. so she could see it and this person yep. had a knife always kind of yep. like up in the air so there was always a threat of you know yeah. i'm gonna kill you kind of hanging in the air and then he was he would also sometimes come closer go. and stuff yeah. uh sounded positively oh, terrifying. i mean it for these people who undergo these experiences even if they've gone through them dozens of times it, it typically is terrifying you know even they can even say to themselves okay and no i've been through this before um you know and the paralysis is going to go away and yet they can't shake the feeling that that presence has some sort of ontological status is some sort of reality and it intends them harm now you might ask like a from a scientific or evolutionary point of view why why would that sort of phenomenology happen you know why, why should we if we you know if we're in a hybrid state you know we're partially awake our brain is awake but our body is still in REM sleep and that's hybrid state why would we have that phenomenology of a sense of a agent who intends us harm yeah it must be dreadful also that you're afraid to fall asleep then. yeah people people that with nightmares for you they avoid sleep you know because they don't want to go through the horror jesus again. you know so they end up sleep deprived all the time which is sad because it's sad because there's very effective treatments for run-of-the-mill nightmares there's cognitive treatments and there's uh medication there's no need to suffer from run-of-the-mill nightmares. What about lucid dreaming? Can lucid dreaming, so the kind of dreaming where you're aware of the fact yeah. that you're dreaming and um, you can also control uh, aspects of the yeah. dream world or whatever. I never experienced it. I'm very jealous. But can lucid dreaming be, be taught? Yes. Um, and what do you think of that skill? Yeah, it can be taught. Um, there, there are... Um, religious traditions that are thousands of years old that cultivate lucid dreaming. The, the idea is in a lucid dream, you can call up a spirit entity and consciously interact, you know, in, in, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, they're called tulpas. You can consciously interact with that spirit entity in a lucid dream and thereby more quickly uh, um, achieve conscious awareness or some sort of spiritual advancement you know but yes lucid dreaming can be taught to anybody i mean i i've 
I find it difficult to lucid dream as well. But um, studies show that most people can be taught it. Um, it's not entirely easy, but it's teachable. It takes a few weeks. And there's several different techniques that tend to work. And I think it's, <clears throat> for many people, it would be worth cultivating because it's it's just a very fascinating realm. You know, you can, you just said you can control your dreams during lucid dreaming. That's partially true. You can control some aspects of it. Like when you told me you had a dream of flying when you were a kid, that's another common theme, by the way, in dreams. <clears throat> the, the, my, my impression has always been that people who have flying dreams more easily learn how to lucid dream because one of the first things people do after they lucid dream is they they oh, fly they're, around because <laughs> it's so much damn fun, you know? Yeah. Um, and then the second thing, second most common thing they do is, of course, have sex with whoever they want. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. But there's so many uh, 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 fascinating things. And there's been some breakthrough studies, even just, uh, you know, last year, six months ago, uh, of um, communicating with people while they're lucid dreaming. You know, somebody's sitting in a lab and they have these prearranged signals to signal, okay, now I'm, I'm lucidly dreaming. And then they can, then they, then they, um, send a signal saying, okay, tell us what's two plus two. And, and then the eyes go back and forth four times, you know, and they go through a series of question and answers. And how come you, you don't wake up if you're so hyper aware? That's, that's a, that's a problem. They do tend to wake up the more tasks you give them. They'll wake right. up. <laughs> yeah. So you got to watch it, but it proof of principle is there that you can c communicate with somebody while they're in lucid REM That's sleep. That's really fascinating. So simple tasks, they keep on lucid dreaming, but if you give give them an Excel sheet like, you know, do my yeah, taxes they're going to wake up. They're going to wake up. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Um it just occurred to me is then if you're sleeping around in your dreams uh, is that cheating then, or or is that fine? If I, you have I, the ability to lucid dream, um, and you're married, for example. Yeah, you'll have to ask for a friend. Them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you do right. It. I mean, there 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 is an interesting literature on the morality of actions we do in dreams. Some really interesting philosophical literature on that. So that's a whole other rabbit hole. I've heard plenty of urban myths regarding lucid dreaming, though. The most common one, it's um, usually it's always someone who knows someone's brother's cousin's sister whose husband, you yeah. know, um, yeah. became addicted to lucid dreaming yeah. um, that he could do everything he possibly wanted in the dream world, which meant that he was just waiting to go to sleep again and kind of stop mm -hmm. participating in waking life. Is that a plausible scenario or is that more? I've something known out of people Hollywood? like that. No, no. I've really? Known, yeah, I have. I have. I mean, there's some people who find it very easy to uh, attain the lucid state and f find it like incredibly adventurous. Um, but there, you know, there are not that many of those people. These kinds of psychonauts, you know, like who, who really explore the, you know, what the, the very interesting things, you know, like the some of the landscapes and the places, the houses remain the same across lucid dreams. So it's, they don't change from dream to dream. There's like continuity across, across dreams along the temporal dimension. So that's really interesting. You know, like they can go back to the same places and find stuff that they stored there, you know, and pick it up and use it in their current dream. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So those, those people, there, there are a handful, there's probably a few thousand who, I wouldn't say they're addicted to lucid dreaming, but it's where they find um, the most fascination. And so they, they can't wait to get back there. And um, I wish they would write books and stuff because they probably know more about it than 
any scientist investigating it who doesn't wow. lucid dream themselves. I mean, it does make sense. If you can do a lot of stuff you can't do in real life, why wouldn't you just, you know, yeah. um, wait to fall back asleep and fly around and, uh, yeah. And, and visit all these, or whatever. all these alternative worlds, you know, yeah. these alternative universes and which you kind of build yourself and you're aware mm -hmm. of that, right? Interesting experiments um, where when you encounter these entities in a lucid dream, you know, like a, say, like if you're religious, a religious entity, like an angel, or if you're non-religious, like some sort of entity from another world, or, you know, space alien or what have you. And you can, you can, say, you can ask them, so are, are you real or are you just a part of my mind? You know, and sometimes you get very interesting answers. Like sometimes, I mean, there are some lucid dreamers, and this is not import. This is not reported in empirical literature yet. But um, you know, in um, online forums, for example, and or in in books on lucid dreaming, you you find reports that the entities respond with information that the dreamer could not possibly have known, and then the and then the dreamer goes and checks it out and it, you know, and it's true. Right. You know, so that, it couldn't be information that this person picked up on accidentally and forgot about it. And then I, this knowledge gets activated in your sleep. That's a, that's a really good point. I think most of the time that's exactly what it is probably. But in this particular case, I satisfied myself after I read it in the online forum that this, could, this could not have been something like that you know like unconscious um memory kind of thing mm. so and anyway it's it's unexplored um we need more researchers in this field mm. we're going all over the place i apologize but i just remembered one more thing about sleep paralysis mm -hmm. that a lot of people who say that they've been abducted by aliens mm. that this can often be perhaps explained by sleep paralysis that's one that's one explanation for the um abduction phenomena you know that these people had sleep paralysis however the people and i don't know really very much about this but my understanding is like for example the psychiatrist um, mac who did a lot of the in-depth interviews with a lot of the abductees way back i mean we're talking you know like in the 70s or 80s or something like that um he when when he did these in-depth interviews with a few hundred of these abductees he couldn't find any history of sleep paralysis in most of them wow okay but who so knows i, I mean it's yeah you know that's one study who knows you know. there's still a lot of mystery out there as soon as you bring up the uh, you know, UFO abductees, I mean, they're all the the tsunami of information we've had about UFOs in the past five years complicates the entire story. You know, so once again, we need more empirically oriented scientists to be and scholars to be investigating all this stuff. Coming back to uh, lucid dreaming did you see christopher nolan's inception movie i did i don't remember much about it i remember liking it you know they kind of go into somebody's dream and they try to plant an idea there what's called an inception or whatever and then they have mm -hmm. a dream within a dream and mm -hmm. they complicate it a little bit too much but it, it's an interesting movie but i was just wondering with if that would even theoretically I, be be possible at uh, all i think i think it might be but the, the reason is complicated. So to start with, there are, there are people who have these dreams within dreams within dreams. And that's a pretty scary phenomenon. Some of them aren't scared by it, but I find it pretty scary. You know, you, you, you have this dream, you wake up, you start your day, you know, you're washing your face, you're starting breakfast, and you're about to go off to work, and then you really wake up. You know, you you were not aware that you were dreaming. Then you really wake. So there's a dream within a dream within a dream, you know. So, um, and then recent work 
using uh, neural imaging and AI algorithms have shown that we can, just by looking at neural imaging um, scans of a brain, we can tell not only that that person is in REM sleep, but to some extent, we can tell what they were dreaming about in terms of, you know, broad scenes and stuff. So, um, um, so ultimately, you will be able to kind of see what the person is dreaming about mm -hmm. more vividly and mm -hmm. in more detail. And then you couple that with the long standing um, ability of cognitive neuroscientists to implant memories. That's a little bit of a scary prospect, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. Right. So sort of like, have you seen Blade Runner? Years ago. Okay. There's these replicants. Um, and, you know, because they want them to be as human as possible, they mm -hmm. implant fake memories in them. Yeah. There um, you go. So they have a fake childhood and they can relate to other humans and stuff. And I always thought that was one of the scariest kind of aspects of, of the idea. Unfortunately, I don't want to alarm your listeners or viewers, but please do. <laughs> I don't want to, but um, I think that the cognitive neuroscience of um, implanting ideas in memories and um, in such a way that they're experienced as self-owned and self-generated, I think we're there already. We can do that. Really? We can, yeah, we can do that. How? Well, there's lots of different techniques. I mean, um, we can do it with what is called targeted memory reactivation techniques, for example. Um, but I mean, marketing teams have been doing stuff like that for decades, you know, so right. it's not that it's not that difficult. Um, you can, you, you, it's, in fact, it's so easy, um, to implant a memory it's done. It's, it was done experimentally just using, um, narrative reports, just having people read a narrative report in the laboratory and then um, um, implanting one phrase in that narrative report. And that's the thing that got, even though that one, th that one sentence was totally unreal, you know, had no basis in reality, but it was remembered as well, simply because it was embedded in information that was trusted. Um, you know, so there's very easy techniques to implant concepts, ideas, and memories. And then there's very um, much more potent targeted techniques. Um, so you pair that with AI algorithms now that can um, make things extremely powerfully um, accurate then I, unfortunately, I think there's going to be a lot of, um, very powerful tools in the hands of the wrong people. Oh, more good news. Um, so it's not even that difficult as you know, the, the inception movie portrays, you have to hack somebody's dreams and stuff. You can do it much more easily. Yeah. As you've just said with simple techniques. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Wonderful. I I signed a letter. This was like a year or two ago. What I can't remember what occasion this, but it a, a lot of dream scientists. There was there was some company like maybe a a beer company that um, was wanted to do an advertising campaign um, around dreams, like putting I don't know what it was. I can't remember what it was, but. But, uh, you know, it woke up a lot of dream scientists and, you know, some three or 400 of us signed a letter saying, you know, we've got to watch out for this stuff and, and it may not be ethical to consult with these companies who want to do this. You know, that I only point that out to, to, to say that the dream science community is, is becoming aware of the ethical issues in, involved in all of this stuff because these techniques are now available to alter the dreams and therefore the daytime behavior, you know, because dreams affect daytime behaviors. 
in one of the videos I watched, you recommended doing a dream journal to people. Mm. Why is that beneficial? It may not be beneficial for everyone, but um, it's probably um, going to be beneficial for most people. Um, you have to understand that um, a great deal of the most significant things in our lives get processed via the dream portal. So why not access that portal, monitor it for a little while and see what turns up. Um, for most people who have done it, gold turns up. So how does that work if we're being very practical? Uh, so as soon as you wake up, you try to remember um, the dream and write it yeah. down as much as you remember it. I like the old fashioned way of getting like a really cool um, looking dream journal, putting it next to the bed in a pen and physically writing it. Because if you physically write it, it's encoded more deeply and you get more out of the the dream images if you do it that way. But a lot of people just, you know, they pick up their, their smartphone next to the bed and and literally say, OK, I just dreamed this. And they they say it and then it's transcribed later, you know. Right. And maybe a, an idea for a movie or a novel will come out of this. Absolutely. Or, yeah, or, or what's the gold that you're referring to? In what form does it oh, I mean, manifest? All, all kinds of ways. I mean, I we could talk for hours about all the discoveries made via the dream. Ah, uh, of course, I see. Both scientific and artistic discoveries, all kinds of musical songs, like you said, um, novels, movies, I mean, all kinds of creative products. But not only that, um, personal gold, like what are the motivational roots of some of your behaviors, for example. Um, there, there's a whole um, new set of empirical studies that um, support some ideas around so-called precognitive dreams, you know, where you can anticipate events that are coming up. Um, it's just, uh, I mean, it's a gold mine. I mean, it's, it's, it's like waiting to be uncovered. I mean, in the, in the ancient world and in, um, hunter gatherer societies and native American societies, for example, and the dream, dreams were considered, um, more real than reality, you know, if you know what I mean. They were considered um, portals into other worlds where you could find out all kinds of really important things about yourself and your tribe. I mean, everything from how to heal an illness to where to stalk your prey. I mean, you would get answers in a dream. In a dream, yeah. Yeah. And since the, the, they were used for, as far as we know, at least 50,000 years because we have cases of dream images on these paleolithic cave art walls, you know, um, people use these use dreams for healing for literally thousands. So they must've been doing something, you know, beyond just placebo. The title of this podcast is Euro trash. So I have to ask you something a little bit trashy at the end. <laughs> If my podcasting career fails and I want to become a modern day sort of Slavic shaman, you know, um, predicting people's futures from their dreams, uh, where would I start with that? Start with, with my a career. dream journal. <laughs> All right. So understanding my own dreams first before yeah. I can advise other people. Yeah. I, and and I, I, would, I would say... Don't anyone take any advice from any dream experts, you know, um, <laughs> find out for yourself. There goes my career. There goes my career. <laughs> all right. So fortune tellers, uh, dream experts, all of those people. Kind of I, no, I, I, think, maybe not. I think you should interact with them, but just be skeptical always, you know. Fine. Everybody's got some gold to give you. So take whatever the gold they have. With being, a grain of salt. With a huge grain of salt, but be enriched by what, what they do have and move on. But do your own explorations. That sounds like really sound advice. Thank you, Professor. Where can people find your work? You've written several several books. Yeah, um, you can find me on Amazon. You have a website, right. Um, 
Yeah, I have books on spirit possession. I have books on dreams. I have books on um, evolution of religion. I have books on all kinds of brain topics. Um, so you can get those at Amazon. Amazon. Um, I, uh, my latest. Do you have any social media? I don't. I I don't like social media. Um, but my my latest website is cognitive neuroscience of religion dot org. Um, because right. I, I'm doing a bunch of um, studies on brain basis of religious and spiritual experiences. Professor McNamara, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks this for those great really, really questions. Cool. Those are really good questions. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you to my lovely patrons, Taichi, Carmen, and Veronica. Thank you for your support. You're amazing. If you want to support Eura Trash too, you can do that. Just go to Patreon and find me there. Right. Thanks again.